Hey everyone, this is part 2 on how to fix rings of power. If you're new at this channel, you will find part 1 on a card on this video or in my channel somewhere. For the sake of convenience, I will release a longer video with the two parts together. At this point in this alternate rings of power, Galadriel Halbrand and the army of Numenor have just sailed for the Southlands. Now I think it's a good time to go back to the beginning and check out Elrond's story. In the original show, Elrond's storyline didn't really have any kind of urgency. He goes to the dwarves, Durin breaks his balls because he hasn't seen him for 20 years, then slowly, very, very slowly, we learn about the mithril and later on what effects it can have on the disease that ravages the lands of the elves. As it stands, Elrond's story doesn't have any kind of urgency, tension or dramatic importance, nor does it have any kind of interesting character development, and of course his storyline doesn't connect with the main storyline of Galadriel until much later on. And I think that's too many problems for one character to have, so let's go ahead and fix them. In this alternate version of Elrond, the king of the elves shows him the disease that ravages a region right from the first episode, and tells him that if we can't find a way to stop it, the elves will have to go back to Valinor. Elrond, being a no-nonsense diplomat, proposes to start evacuating immediately. The elves already have a home in Valinor, they've been in Middle-earth for ages. The threat of Sauron and his orcs has been vanquished, so Elrond believes that there is really no reason to stay in Middle-earth anymore. And here it would be nice to give the character of the king some flaws as well. He doesn't want to go to Valinor, maybe because there is a hint that Galadriel's insistence that Sauron and the orcs are back got to him. We don't know, we're not sure. The king informs Elrond that one of his spies has told him that the dwarves have found a new mineral that can maybe help with this strange disease. It's a long shot, but it would be wise to check it out. Elrond isn't entirely convinced, but he obeys the orders of his king and goes to the dwarves anyway. There he finds the dwarves changed, they behave strangely, secretively, like they're protecting something. I would keep somewhat the same events in the Durin slash Elrond storyline. Now that Elrond knows his mission is to get the Mithril from the get-go and in the process save Eregion and the elves, his story takes a much more needed urgency. This urgency will give his storyline a clear direction and it will create opportunities for good drama and heightened tension as he tries to get the Mithril from the dwarves. In the original version, Elrod's storyline was bogged down by slice-of-life elements that took too long to progress and made his story feel boring and unimportant because there was no urgency behind it. Only much later on in the season, there was some tension when the King of the Elves told Elrod of the importance of the Mithril. That's why in this alternate version, the Mithril has to be revealed right away, and as changes go, Elrond has to change as well. He needs to be a diplomat that, as the story progresses, becomes a spy. Elrond sees the rift between Túrin and his father, sees the two factions within the dwarves' camp growing, and I think it would work well that throughout the season we follow that rift, opening wide open, and in the end a small-scale civil war slash conflict breaks, with casualties on both sides. Durin, consumed with greed, wants to mine the mithril and make the dwarves rich, but his father is old and stubborn and he feels that an ancient evil will be awakened if the mithril is extracted. The changes in Elrond's storyline will add tension and remove the slow, slice-of-life element of the story of the dwarves. In Rings of Power, the main storyline is about Galadriel, Halbrand, Númenor and the threat of Sauron and the orcs. So the Elrond storyline didn't really have a lot of time to grow. I would keep the civil war in a slow burn mode, something that takes half the season to really unfold. Because in this alternate version Galadriel stays in Númenor for only an episode or two, I think there will be ample time to focus on Elrond and see his story grow. There we will see Elrond torn between his identity as a diplomat and a friend of Durin and someone that needs to do anything he can so he can acquire the Mithril and save Eregion and the elves from ruin. In the end, the story of the dwarves should end much in the same way as the show. Durin and his father reconcile, but in the alternate version, his father pulls rank and makes the decision to close the Mithril mine without giving any to Elrond no matter the consequences for the elves.
Here we see some agency, grit and personal growth from Elrond when he sneaks inside the mine during the night and steals a small quantity of the mithril, which at the end of the season will be used to make the Elven rings. Elrond lives for a region with the mithril accompanied with a small band of Elven warriors. A few nights before Galadriel reaches the Southlands, Eider and his orcs search for the broken sword of Sauron. Arondir, having escaped from their concentration camp the day before, has already warned the villagers and they all have run and hid in the watchtower. The orcs siege the tower but fail to capture it. Arondir knows it's only a matter of time until the orcs break through, so he has the villagers create a distraction and escapes on his horse carrying the sword of Sauron with him. He knows that Eider and the orcs want to get the sword back more than anything else, so it makes sense that they would follow him and leave the villagers alone. When a little bit later the orcs break through the watchtower, Eider learns from one of the villagers about the deep relationship between Arondir and the widow, so Eider puts a knife to her son's throat, threatening her that if she doesn't help him find Arondir and the sword of Sauron, her son will die. Torn between her love of Arondir and her son, she chooses the latter. Arondir has told her where he was going, because he wanted them to follow him when the orcs lifted the seeds. So the widow, alongside a few orcs, rides for Arondir. Now it would be interesting if there is a deeper, personal and more selfish reason for the betrayal of the widow. All this time, she has sensed that Arondir still has feelings about that peasant girl that died long ago. Arondir hasn't told her much about this girl, but her jealousy has been eating away at her for some time now. It kills her that she has to split Arondir's love with someone else, even if that someone is dead. And in some level, she wants to hurt him because she thinks he doesn't love her completely. So the widow's betrayal has both an external reason, either blackmailing her, and an internal reason as well. Before all of that, during the big distraction at the siege of the Watchtower, a lot of the villagers managed to sneak away through a small service door and they have gone back to their village to get some of their belongings and run away. Eider and the orcs hunt them down and start killing them, but not before Galadriel and the army of Númenor come to their rescue. As I've said in my review, the army of Númenor isn't really an army, 300 men are way too few mainly because Númenor has no idea how many orcs they will face. So it stands to reason that Elendil will press Galandriel to send a few scouts ahead, so they can at least have some valuable information about the army they will face. But Galadriel is so bloodthirsty that she refuses. The army of Númenor is much better at fighting than the orcs, so Eidar seeing the battle not going his way, he orders a full retreat, making sure to keep the son of the widow close by. He's the only hold that he has against the widow. The army of Númenor chase Eider and the orcs through the forest. Now, I never really felt any real danger or any threat coming from Eider. He's like this one-dimensional classic bad guy, dressed all in black following all the tropes coming from old B-movies. But the thing is, he could have been so much more. Eider is an immortal elf that turns bad. Someone like him, with so much knowledge and experience, should have had a much better plan about getting the Sword of Sauron back and creating allies in the process. It's the same total lack of intelligence and forethought that all the elven characters are written with. So I think it would fit in this alternate version if Eidar was a little more intelligent and capable of strategic thought. He has already scouted the area and as Galadriel and the army of Númenor chase him and his orcs, he leads them to a swampy part of the forest. The horses of Númenor get stuck and the heavily armored knights become easy prey for the orcs, since their armor weighs them down and they can't move as fast as they would like. Eider inflicts a ton of casualties on the army of Númenor, but it costs him a lot of orcs. His priority is still finding the sword of Sauron, so he retreats and leaves the army of Númenor to lick their wounds. Meanwhile, during the battle, Queen Miriel suffered a heavy blow to the head, and for now, her condition will be about the same as in the original show. She loses her sight and can't go on. At this point, Galadriel, bloodthirsty from the battle, orders the army of Númenor to chase down the last remaining orcs. But since Queen Miriel is incapacitated, Elendil is the one in charge. He refuses and insists that Queen Miriel must be taken back to the ships to recuperate. She can't ride fast in such a state and there aren't enough knights to split the force in half. Galadriel is livid. She can feel how close she is to winning and killing all the orcs. 
As someone who is an immortal princess, consumed with the thirst for revenge for her brother, she views the lives of the injured mortal men and the blinding of Queen Miriel as accepted losses of war. So she puts a sword to the throat of Elendil to make him order his knights to obey her commands, but Elendil doesn't back down and a fight ensues. Halbrand and Isildur have already made their alliances and have secured the support of a few men. We can have a short B-plot before the battle where Halbrand, Isildur and his friends go on a little side quest and raid a small village where Halbrand knows there are some keepsakes hidden. The treasure is quite small, but it blinds Isildur nonetheless. After this, his loyalty to Halbrand will be much stronger. As the battle between Galadriel's forces and Elendil's rages on, Elendil is shook that his own son is against him. Of course, he doesn't want to fight him, but as I've said, the rules in this video is that the characters should start and end in about the same place as in the original version. The show gave Isildur a fake death trapped in the burning house, but we know that he's alive because he was alive in the Lord of the Rings lore and opening of the first movie in the montage sequence. And a similar thing will happen now. During the battle, some of the Knights of Númenor push the less armored and experienced men of Isildur towards a cliff. Elendil, realizing that his son is in mortal danger, orders the knights to retreat, but his commands get lost in the heat of battle. The ground at the edge of the cliff gives away, and Isildur and some of his men fall. Elendil is crushed, thinking that his son has died. At this moment, his sense of loyalty and honor to his men and queen is all that he has left, and he doesn't want to lose them too, so he orders a full retreat and goes back to the ships with Queen Miriel and whatever knights he has left. Meanwhile, Arondir's horse is near its breaking point from the constant riding, so he makes a small detour and finds refuge in an elven watchtower, a similar structure with the military outpost that we saw earlier in the show. But there is another reason he chose to stop in this watchtower. It's because this is the place where the rendezvous between him and the widow is. Arondir's thinking was that he could ride to Eregion with the Sword of Sauron, while the widow and her son are safe in the hands of the elven soldiers in the watchtower. Arondir asks the soldiers for a new horse to keep riding, but the soldiers, seeing how exhausted he is, tell him that they have seen with their elven eyes a band of elven warriors coming to the watchtower. That's Elrond carrying the mithril, and the two storylines start to merge. In the show it happened way too late in the season, and Elrond had absolutely no effect in whatever Galadriel was doing. As I've said before, Elrond's story felt much more disconnected with Galadriel's, Halbrand's and Numenor's storylines. But with this change, whatever choice Galadriel or Elrond or Arondir makes, it will influence and impact its other stories. From now on, because all the storylines are connected, the overall story of Rings of Power will be more balanced and concise. The elven soldiers of the Watchtower tell Arondir that since there is a storm outside, it's better to just wait until Elrond and his warriors arrive and he can join them in his journey to Eregion. It would be safer that way. So Arondir rests for a bit, but not until the widow arrives outside the Watchtower. The orcs that accompany her remain hidden in the nearby woods. Arondir tells the elven guards to let the widow in and she's second that she now has to manipulate the men she loves. During the night, she finds the Sword of Sauron, still wrapped in the black cloth, takes it and sneaks outside of the Watchtower. Arondir realizes what has happened, catches up to her, second that she betrayed him. He puts the tip of his sword on her belly, but his love for her is still strong. She tells him that Aedara has her son and she had no choice. Arondir takes the Sword of Sauron back from her, but the orcs that the widow came with swarm out of the woods and attack. Soon, this little fight grows into a full battle when Adar and his orcs run down the hill toward Arondir. At the same time, Elrond and his warriors, not knowing exactly what's going on, but seeing their elven brother in danger, they join the battle. Arondir tries to protect the widow and the sword of Sauron. He's a fierce warrior and kills every orc that comes near him. But things quickly turn for the worse. The widow sees Adar holding her son at knife point. He signals her that if she doesn't stop Arondir, her son is dead. So she hits Arondir at the back of the head and when he loses consciousness, she steals the sword of Sauron and gives it to Adar. Adar takes the widow and her son with him and alongside a few orcs, they ride away. Galadriel and her band of warriors arrive after the battle is done. Disappointed that she missed all the fun, she informs Elrond what has happened so far and asks for warriors to chase down Adar. 
But Elrond's priority is taking the Mithril back to Eregion, all this time with the dwarves, the political machinations and the slam manipulation against Durin and his father have made him a little more cynical than he used to be, so he refuses. The Mithril is more important. If the elves are secure and Eregion is saved, then can deal with whatever orcs are left at a later time. Galadriel, furious that no help is given to her, alongside Halbrand and her band of warriors, chase Adar by themselves and catch up to him much in the same way it happened in the show. The difference here is that the weak, white-haired villager that plunges the Sword of Sauron into the ancient Lego mechanism is replaced with a widow. She obeys Adar's commands because she fears for the life of her son. Now, of course, this whole thing, the sword, the Lego mechanism, the ensuing volcano eruption is just plain stupid. Volcanoes don't work like that, but as I've said, the rules in this video are clear. We won't have huge deviation from the original plot of the show, and I have already allowed myself a few chases and battles to be added to strengthen the characters and give them some moral dilemmas so they can become more fleshed out and real. But the volcano has to go boom, and indeed it does. Galadriel is more upset that Halbrand is injured in the battle than the whole of Southlands being destroyed. The original show teased something like a quasi-romance between them but never really had the balls to go there. But if not exactly a romance, there could be the inklings of one. So Galadriel at this time wants to care for Halbrand, but her primary need is still the same. She wants to prove that she was right all along so she can gain the respect of the elves back. So she cuts the head of an orc, bugs it, because she needs something that would work as a tangible proof that the orcs are back, and alongside a gravely injured Halbrad, head back to Eregion. In the original version of the show, Adar had managed to escape during the confusion when the volcano erupted. Aroder, the widow, and her son end up all back together, and that's how their stories basically end in the first season. Aroder and the widow's characters are very lackluster, their stories don't really go anywhere and having them return to the same point they started, a family of sorts, with little conflict and no desires of their own, is a bit lazy dramatically and a bit vanilla for my tastes. In this alternate version, the widow is the one that plays the Sword of Sauron in the Lego mechanism and caused the volcano to erupt, and soon after, when she saw all the devastation it caused, she has now found herself deeply ashamed of her actions. She doesn't even know if her son survived the explosion and thinks she might have killed him in the process. Arondre, not knowing that she was the one that hit him over the head during the battle, still cares for her and ends up searching and finding her in the woods grieving and tells her not to worry, her kid is fine and he brings her back to what remained of the village. Arondre's stoic demeanor will help keep a lead for now to all the questions that he should be asking like, how did the widow and her son escape Adar? Did he let them go? And if that is the case, why? All these questions would work as a future dramatic conflict for Arondir. Questions like that would burn his mind and push him to confront the widow at some point. When they come back from the forest, Arondir, the widow and her son reunite, but the widow now has to keep all her actions that led to this point a secret. Not knowing if and when Adar comes back, and if Aroder or someone else at the village suspects something. Her secrets will give all the boring family slash romantic scenes with Aroder a new purpose and some much needed tension to go along with it. Now, in every interaction with him, she will wonder Does he know that I hit him over the head and stole the Sword of Sauron and gave it to Adar? Does he know that I caused the volcano to erupt? As things stand, Queen Miriel and whatever is left from her army is going back to Numenor to find it destroyed. Isildur is considered dead, and all these storylines have basically reached their end. So, now we go back to Galadriel and Halbrand. They arrive at Eregion, but are refused entrance. Elrond and the other elves are not happy that Galadriel wants a mortal man to enter Eregion, but after she insists, they let them through. Galadriel leaves Halbrand to an elven doctor and prepares for her meeting with the king. She takes the head of the orc she took with her and sticks it on a spear and marches it through a region, holding it high so everyone can see. Feel free to call this Mad Lad Galadriel or something of the sorts. When Galadriel arrives in front of the king, she brandishes the head of the orc and tells him, I was right all along. Awkward silence and quiet rage slash sigh ensues from Elrond until the king finally acknowledges Galadriel's success and declares that the orcs are back for everyone to hear. He promises Galadriel an army 
so she can deal with the orcs. As soon as the solution is found to the disease that ravages the ancient trees of Eregion and threatens the lives of the elves. Quite happy with all of that, Galadriel goes back to the elven doctor to check on Halbrand, but the doctor informs her that Halbrand's wounds are too great and doesn't know if he'll survive. Galadriel has a brief somber scene with Halbrand until she retreats to her quarters to think about all that has happened. Now in this moment of grim quietness, we see the mark of Sauron on her arm is becoming more clear. As she touches it, she starts to hear the creepy whispers that we heard at the beginning, when the son of the widow unveiled the sword of Sauron. Terrified, she puts on a new change of clothes and goes to Celebrimbor. She wants to help him with the mithril so she can take her mind off the strange mark on her arm. Celebrimbor tells her he tried everything but the mithril doesn't bond with other metals. Disappointed with that, she goes to check on Halbrand, prepared even for his death. But once she arrives, she stunned to find him in perfect health and all smiles. Halbrand tells her that we mere mortals are stronger than you elves think. This sudden improvement in his health perplexes Galadriel. She starts thinking that maybe something is up with Halbrand, but in the end doesn't pursue it any further because her mind is on the creation of the rings. Of course, in the original show, Galadriel did start it suspecting Halbrand after this, but the reason was quite silly. Halbrand had told her he came from the line of the kings of the Southlands. The fact that the line of that particular kings has been cut for a thousand years is what she uses to reveal Halbrand's true identity, but that revelation is a bit lazy. Since Galadriel is thousands of years old, she should have already known that, because she was there when it happened. That's why Alter and Halbrand doesn't hide the fact that the line of the kings has been cut and introduces himself as a bastard who wants to reclaim his lost throne. Alter and Galadriel already knows that and views Halbrand as a petty would-be king, but he's charming enough to go along with the charade, and Halbrand admits as much earlier in the Alter and events when questioned by Queen Miriel. Instead, the revelation of Halbrand as Sauron must be tied to the very reason he came to Eregion, the Mithril and the creation of the Rings of Power. Both of these elements were the victim of fast and lazy writing, minimizing the story and characters and cutting corners to get to the Sauron revelation as fast as possible, so Halbrand is suddenly free to go anywhere he pleases inside Eregion without any guards, and finds himself in Celebrimbor's lab after using some manipulation techniques that even an 80-year-old would see coming a mile away, he convinces Celebrimbor to mix the mithril with other elements so he can create the rings. Now, I might add, that is stupid beyond belief because Celebrimbor, a blacksmith with a few thousand years of experience, would already know that. It would have been the first thing on his list because, you know, that's how blacksmithing works. The difference here with this alternate version of events is that Halbrand will suggest using a less quantity of the mithril and gently pushes for Celebrimbor to try again with a various different combinations of other metals. Halbrand's plan, after all, is the creation of the rings, and it suits him just fine if there is more than one ring. If more elves are corrupted, especially kings and queens, the better for him, because he would be corrupting the leadership of the elves and making their rule less stable, and less stable government is eligible to be influenced and corrupted. Kellen Bribor, of course, would be furious that Halbrand, a mere mortal, would give him suggestions about blacksmithing. After some soothing words from Galadriel, Kellen Bribor gives the shot and starts working on the mithril again. But not before he insists that Halbrand leave his lab. Halbrand doesn't particularly like that, but goes outside anyway. Kellen Bribor tries again a combination of metals that he had already tried before. After a while, he stares at the burning embers, shocked. The mithril is bonding. He has no idea how is that so because it didn't work just moments before. As he cries out in joy, Galadriel feels pain coming from the mark of Sauron on her arm, and she starts to hear the creepy whispers once again. She turns and looks around, something, a feeling is drawing her outside. She follows the whispers out of the lab until she sees Halbrand. He stands by the water, his back is at her, his head looking at the sky, his hands outstretched. As he comes near him, the creepy whispers in her head are deafening, when she touches him, the mark on her arm lights up and she gasps in pain. Halbrand turns and Galadriel staggers back as Halbrand reveals his true shadowy form as Sauron. The whispers were the spell that Halbrand slash Sauron made to bond the mithril into the three elven rings so he can control them. In this alternate version of events, 
A magical aspect is introduced to the creation of the rings that either wasn't really there in the original version or it was left for us to speculate at best at least. When Galadriel confronts Halbrand, now Sauron, all the events that brought these two together will be revealed. Halbrand will tell Galadriel that her thirst for events has been corrupting her for millennia, coming into a frenzy height these last few months. He felt this corruption drawing him closer to her, even from a thousand miles away, and that is why he was at the raft in the beginning of the story, searching for her. So no contrivance or coincidence is needed for them to meet. Sauron was actively looking for Galadriel, and because Galadriel is an elf, someone that is supposed to be above everyone else, in a moral sense at least, it made it much more easier for him to track her down, because she was the only elf that has been corrupted by vengeance. Now, I'm not really into the Tolkien lore, and this is a fan fiction video, so I have no idea if that's even a thing or not, or even if it has happened before in the Tolkien stories, but I'm going with it anyway. Halbrand's justification for his character will be the same as with the show. He needs Galadriel by his side so they can rule Middle-earth together. In the original version, Galadriel was indeed obsessed and did questionable things, but the show never treated her as someone that did anything wrong or that she needed to repent for her actions. But here Halbrand hammers the point that Galadriel has strayed from the beaten path. Because of her, Queen Miriel has become blind, the army of Númenor has been destroyed and Galadriel failed to protect the Southlands and its peoples. And all of that happened because she was too focused on revenge and clearing her name by proving the orcs were back. All of that will hit especially hard for Galadriel because all of it is true. After all, she did blackmail Queen Miriel for the army of Númenor and in the end brought down their destruction. But Halbrand doesn't view Galadriel's actions as a bad thing. He's a big picture dude and he quite likes it that Galadriel has the same philosophy as him, that the end justifies the means. Now, it would be interesting if Galadriel is actually tempted by Halbrand, even if it's for a moment, especially when he tells her that when the elves find out she led Sauron inside the region, she will be cast out and be left alone in the world. This temptation for total power is important because it gives layers to Galadriel and it will connect with the events of the Lord of the Rings movies when Frodo suggested to Galadriel to take the ring herself, but she freaked out, and she freaked out because it has happened to her before. This moment here will be the setup for that particular payoff. Here in this moment, she understands what she will gain by siding with Sauron and what exactly she will lose, and this thought absolutely terrifies her. Just now she realizes how far vengeance has taken her, she realizes the consequences of her actions and what really is at stake. A temptation like that doesn't exist at all in the original show and I think it's completely necessary for the character. You can't have an anti-hero that does all these questionable things all season and not have a moment that is actually tempted by Sauron's offer. Now finally to go back to the scene, an extremely terrified Galadriel pushes Halbrand away and severs the connection. When she wakes up, he's gone. Along with him, the mark on her arm is gone as well. She has rejected him and now she's on a new path. In the show, Elrond found her by the water unconscious and the story had to bend over backwards so she won't reveal that Halbrand was Sauron. She tells Elrond to trust her and like an idiot, he does. Just because the episode was ending and the writers had run out of time. But here in this version, Galadriel wakes up alone. She hurries to her chambers unseen, changes and suffers quietly. She knows that the elves must not know that she let Sauron inside a region. The show ended with Galadriel insisting that three rings will be created instead of one, and the alternate events will also end much in the same way. But since we have allowed Galadriel to have some time for herself and realize where her choices has led her as a character, the creation of the rings will be more tragic and have much more impact on her. Galadriel has achieved everything she set out for, she has proven that Sauron and his orcs are back, and she has cleared her name, but all of that came at a great cost, it was a pyrrhic victory. She knows that since Sauron has helped create the rings of the elves, that those rings will also have a corrupting influence on her people, but she can't say anything about Halbrand slash Sauron, because she will again lose their respect and her position as commander. 
She has been given an army to chase the orcs, but all she wants now is to stay back and find a way to break the spell that Sauron has placed inside the rings. And of course, as we know from the lore, that's not possible at this time. As for Halbrand, Galadriel will tell Elrond and Celebrimbor that he was ungrateful for all the help the elves have given him, and with the first sense he got, he left for the Southlands so he can claim his rights as a king. Since none of the elves wanted to let Halbrand inside the region in the first place, Galadriel knows that she's safe from Halbrand from now at least. It would be quite difficult for him to get inside the land of the elves for a second time without her help. This alternate Halbrand has spent much of the season creating alliances with Isildur and his friends and the beardy politician and Queen Miriel. He is not someone that will go to his volcano and sit on his fiery throne until Galadriel comes to him. He has plans of his own to create a massive kingdom with him as a ruler. So, to recap, in this alternate version of events, we meet Galadriel as an impulsive anti-hero, someone that does bad things for a good reason. But her actions slowly catch up to her, consequences start to mount, people get hurt and die, and most of the time she's either unaware of the bad things she does, or simply she doesn't care because she's consumed by vengeance, until the end that is, in the Halbrand slash Sauron scene. After that, she finds herself a tragic figure with little options. These changes bring more nuance and subjects for the story and characters. Galadriel will need to go against the orcs while her heart is back to Eregion and the rings. She has secrets to keep and a grudge against Halbrand slash Sauron, but this grudge has a deeper meaning because all of what Halbrand said about her was true. Her quest of revenge did bring destruction and suffering, and now she has to reconcile with those feelings. Now compare all these changes to show Galadriel. The writers of the show never treated Galadriel as someone that does bad things. She isn't really an anti-hero. Instead, she's portrayed as a classic main character, a hero. She's not really confronted with any of her mistakes all season. And in the finale, after the rings are created, her story just ends and we don't get a scene where Galadriel has to reconcile with her mistakes and accept all the bad things she did. That's why I think all the changes in this video work much better and give Galadriel a much more honest look about her. She does bad things and people suffer and die because of her, but she realizes and accepts all those things and now she's on a new path to correct her mistakes. And for this alternate Galadriel story, that's pretty much it. I think all the changes work much better than the original show. It gives the character a tragic anti-hero aspect that was much needed, I think. For Elrond, he started out as a hopeful and decent diplomat and ended up a cynical spy, someone that doesn't like or trust that the elves are not dependent on these rings for their survival. So Elrond is basically a boy scout. What worries him most is losing his friendship to Durin. His story had no urgency, not until the final episode that is. In these alternate events, Elrond is introduced to the Sadui disease right from the start. He knows what he has to do to save his people and so do we. The events that follow slowly put pressure on him and he starts to change, which so Elrond never did. He just gets pushed to the sidelines in the final episode because there was nothing really for him to do. And although so Elrond does end with him having serious doubts about Halbrand and the creation of the rings, his storyline doesn't feel complete. He didn't really have any difficult choices all season and he was always a pushover, as shown early in the finale when Galadriel asked him to trust her, and he did. A timid boy scout is not someone that you would expect to actually do something serious and confront Galadriel about all her misdeeds. But having Elrond slowly throughout the season become a spy and manipulate Durin and his father and in the end achieve his goal by stealing the mithril, that is someone that you would expect to have some balls and actually do something about Galadriel. That is someone that you would want to watch out for. But so Elrond is about as threatening as a lukewarm tea. I mean, what's he gonna do? Write her a strongly worded letter? Come on. And that's about it for this alternate Rings of Power. Let me know in the comments what do you think of the changes in character and story. These longer videos take a long time to produce, so I would appreciate if you like the video and subscribe. That's it for today, guys. See you soon.